Many historical so-called facts that became common knowledge are simply not true. Part of the fault fall upon the shoulders of inventive writers and Hollywood film producers. But don't be too harsh on them. They are always aiming to create a good story that'll sell well. And in ancient times, chroniclers told their stories from their own perspective, explained in ways that made sense to them. So let's explore some facts you thought were real, but are in fact totally made up. Hello, and welcome to 7 Facts. Since I'm a Romanian, I might as well get it over with. Dracula was real, but he wasn't a vampire. The short version of the story is that Dracula was a Romanian prince from the 15th century who basically sold his soul to the devil and became an immortal vampire. The real story, albeit simplified, is this. Vlad III of Wallachia, also known as Vlad the Impaler, was a Romanian voivode or prince from the 15th century. He was the son of Vlad Dracul. That name, Dracul, in Old Romanian means dragon, while nowadays it only means devil. He got that name because he was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a military order that required its initiates to defend the cross and fight the enemies of Christianity. His son became known as Dracula, or Draculea, but it was his deeds that made him famous. He was a capable and bold military leader and fought against the Ottoman Turks, among others. For this reason, he is considered one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history and a national hero of Romania. At the same time, he also earned a reputation as an exceptionally cruel prince. He had the habit of impaling his enemies, but he also fancied other methods, such as beheading, boiling, burning, skinning or maiming. One episode in the history of this ruler sums it all up. In 1461, Vlad refused to pay tribute to the Ottomans, so Mehmed II, the same who conquered Constantinople, raised an army nearly as large as the one he had used to besiege the great imperial capital. Outnumbered 3 to 1, Vlad applied a scorched earth policy. He torched crops, poisoned wells, and evacuated the villages in Mehmed's path in order to deprive the Ottomans of any supplies. He even attempted to kill the Sultan himself in a night raid and he almost succeeded. But the Turks couldn't be stopped and they continued their march. When the Ottomans finally reached the capital Turgoviste, they saw, to their surprise, that the city gates were swung open, no soldiers stood watch upon the walls, and the capital's residents were nowhere to be seen. But then, they found something far more disturbing. A grotesque forest of wooden stakes piled high with skewered Ottoman corpses. Calcocondyles, a contemporary Greek historian, claims that there were 20,000 bodies in all, arrayed over an area of more than 7 acres. After taking in as much of the site as he could stomach, Mehmed turned his army around and marched back to Turkey. This is, in short, the real prince who inspired the story of Dracula the Vampire. But the story itself had only taken his name. The rest of the narrative was inspired purely by folk tales of vampires and evil spirits. A story of ancient times that still survives to this day is that of Jason and the Argonaut. While some believe it to be a true tale, well, it's not. At least not entirely. The legend comes from around the 8th century BC and tells the story of Jason and his fellow band of heroes, who in the years before the Trojan War, around 1300 BC, accompanied Jason to Colchis in his quest to find the Golden Fleece. By the way, the term Argonauts comes from their ship, Argo, named after its builder, Argus. Thus, Argonauts literally means sailors of Argo. In this story, they had to go through Simplegades, or the Simple Gates, a pair of rocks at the Bosphorus that clashed together whenever a vessel went through. Their destination, Colchis, is the modern-day country of Georgia. Now, we can piece together a puzzle. 
The story of Jason and the Argonauts might be inspired by the true stories of Greek explorers of the Black Sea. The Black Sea coast is littered, by the way, with ancient Greek colonies, so they definitely went there. The simple gates were simply the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits, two extremely narrow straits. Colchis was inhabited by the early ancestors of Georgians, who had the sacred idol, the Golden Ram. Furthermore, sheepskin was a common item used to separate gold dust from other rocks in mountain rivers. If Jason would have been real, he could have actually found a golden fleece in Colchis. So this is more likely the source of Jason's story. But no Herculean heroes though, unfortunately. There was a myth that actually still circulates to this day that the nose of the Egyptian Sphinx was vandalized by Napoleon's troops. It was said that in 1798 French troops used the nose as target practice and destroyed it in the process. If this was a real event, it would probably be one of the most absurd cases of vandalism in history. But as you might have guessed, it's not true. A drawing from 1755 made by a Danish explorer already showed the Sphinx with its missing nose. The real culprit of the destruction was Muhammad Saim al-Dar, a Sufi Muslim religious leader. In 1378, he found the local peasants making offerings to the Sphinx in the hope of increasing their harvest, and therefore defaced the Sphinx in an act of iconoclasm. The reason why people might have thought that Napoleon's troops were the culprits was because of a drawing from 1737 that had an artistic recreation of the Sphinx's nose. The act of vandalism was then blamed on Napoleon because, well, propaganda. Before we continue, I'd like to ask you something. This channel has no sponsors, so if you enjoy the content I make, please consider supporting these videos by becoming a patron. You can check out my Patreon page by clicking here or find the link in the description. Now let's move on to the next fact. Several cultures on Earth develop myths about giants. One particular kind of giant is the Cyclops. Nowhere is this one-eyed creature more present than in Greek mythology. It turns out that this myth might have had a glimpse of truth to it. Until about 38,000 years ago, there was a dwarf species of mammoth, Mammutus lamarmorae, living on the island of Sardinia and possibly Sicily. It had a height of only 1.4 meters, so this was indeed a small creature compared to its continental cousins. Their skulls have a big gaping hole right in the middle. That's where, of course, their trunk used to be. But early farmers could have unearthed these large skulls, see the hole in the middle, and voila, the myth of one-eyed giants was born. Since in ancient times these islands used to be inhabited by Greek colonists, the story of the Cyclops easily traveled throughout the entire Greek world, thus inspiring other stories of nearby cultures. The next story might not be known throughout the world, but it's certainly a familiar tale for Americans. The cherry tree myth is the most well-known and longest enduring legend about George Washington. In the original story, when Washington was six years old, he received a hatchet as a gift and damaged his father's cherry tree. When his father discovered what he had done, he became angry and confronted him. Young George bravely said, I cannot tell a lie. I did cut it with my hatchet. Washington's father embraced him and rejoiced that his son Honesty was worth more than a thousand trees. But this never actually happened. This iconic story about the value of honesty was invented by one of Washington's first biographers, a minister and bookseller named Mason Locke Weems. After Washington's death in 1799, people were anxious to learn about him and Weems was ready to supply the demand. He even explained to a publisher why he did it. Washington, you know, is gone. Millions are gaping to read something about him. My plan? I give his history sufficiently minute. I then go on to show that his unparalleled rise and elevation were due to his great virtues. 
The Great Fire of Rome in 64 AD is a well-known event from the ancient times. And we all know that Emperor Nero did it, right? Wrong. Rumor had it that Nero had started the fire to rebuild Rome in his image. Therefore, to blame someone else for it and thus exonerate the emperor from blame, the fire was said to have been caused by the already unpopular Christians. There were unconfirmed rumors that Nero sang from a private stage during the fire. While Nero was indeed a cruel despot you wouldn't want in your life, he wasn't actually that crazy. In fact, he was extremely popular among ordinary people, it was the ruling elites who truly despised him. The emperor was not even in the city at the time of the fire, and when he returned, he was committed and energetic in organizing accommodation and relief for the refugees. The legend of Nero fiddling as Rome burned is probably just that, a legend. He did, however, put the new and secretive sect of the Christians in the spotlight. When Nero looked for a scapegoat, they were it. Nero's resulting persecution of the Christians put them on the pages of mainstream history for the first time, and the subsequent suffering of thousands of Christian martyrs thrusted the new religion into a spotlight that saw it gain millions more devotees over the following centuries. But the fire? It was probably only an accident, as were most great fires throughout history. Robert de Bruce was a king of Scotland in the Middle Ages. He is regarded as a national hero who fought and won against the English, thus regaining Scotland's place among the independent kingdoms of Europe. The reason for his determination? A spider, or so the story goes. According to a legend, at some point while he was on the run, Bruce hid in a cave where he observed the spider spinning a web, trying to make a connection from one area of the cave's roof to another. It tried and failed twice, but began again and succeeded on the third attempt. Inspired by this, Bruce returned to inflict a series of defeats on the English, thus winning him more supporters and eventually victory. The entire account may in fact be a version of a literary trope used in biographical writing. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. The story first appeared in 1828 in a book called Tales of a Grandfather, which was 500 years after the death of Robert. It is inspiring and holds a great deal of wisdom, but that doesn't make it true. Nevertheless, the story spread and just became common knowledge. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. The link is in the description. I hope to see you next time. Bye.